Hello everybody, welcome back to another Civi 398 assignment tutorial. In this assignment tutorial we're going to be covering assignment 10 question 1 and yes unfortunately this is going to be the last uh, question for marks of Civi 398. So if we look at this assignment it's only one question, question 1, and the question says the fixed ends Euler Bernoulli beam below is subjected to a point load P of 27 kilonewtons at a distance D of 1.5 meters from the left end of the beam. The length L, Young's modulus E, and moment of inertia I of the beam are 10 meters, 20 GPA, and 0.003 meters to the fourth, respectively. Now, normally, you guys know, I don't post the image of the beam, but being the last assignment, I felt a little generous. So here you guys go, a nice pictorial representation of this beam. So it's a very simple beam, just both ends are fixed, and in the not really in the center of the beam, but the only external load on this beam is a concentrated point load. And with this beam, the question wants us to do a variety of things. The first one is find the exact displacement function of the beam from 0 to D, and the second part is find the exact displacement function of the beam from D to L. So it's very important to notice that the beam is subjected to a point load which creates a discontinuity. And because of this, if we are looking for the exact solution, which is what we are doing in part A and B, we actually have to split the beam up into two regions, one on the left side of the concentrated load and one on the right side of the concentrated load. So part A and B, it's basically just asking for the exact displacement function of the beam. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the exact solution. Again, this is something you guys have seen and basically your last four assignments, you guys are now experts at this because we know that we can find the exact solution by solving the differential equation for Euler-Bernoulli beams, which is EI multiplied by the fourth derivative of our deflection is equal to our distributed load Q. Now for us, it actually gets a little bit simple because in our particular beam, we have no distributed load. Therefore, EI multiplied by the fourth derivative of the displacement function is actually going to be equal to zero. So it's actually looking pretty good. But as we mentioned, we actually have a problem because that concentrated load we have creates a discontinuity in our beam. Therefore, instead of solving for one continuous deflection function, we actually have to solve for two, one in each region of the beam. How do we do this? Well, we're actually going to cut our beam into two sections and look at each section separately. So in the next slide, we're going to discuss how we do that. So let's say that we have our beam. Again, we know that the ends are fixed and it's subjected to a point load P. If we were to look at the shear diagram of this beam, it's very easy to see that we actually have that discontinuity. In the left side of the point load, we have a positive shear region, and then after that distributed load P, it transitions into a negative shear region. Now, if I want to express this equation for the shear force, we can see that it's actually a piecewise function. It's not continuous, and this is what creates the problems for us. So in order to account for this, what we're going to do is we are going to cut the beam at the location of that point load. What will this do? Well, this will effectively give us two different beams, and these are what we are going to analyze separately to find the displacement functions on each side of the beam. So the thing that we have to remember is if we cut a beam, we're going to release those internal forces. This goes all the way back to Eng 130. You guys are experts at this. But now if we look right here, it actually looks pretty easy because we actually have two separate solutions. And each one of these solutions, the one on the left, the one on the right, they can be governed by the same differential equation we discussed above. So on the left side, when I'm looking at the region from 0 to D, I'm going to be using the exact same differential equation. But instead of a general displacement function Y, I'm going to call this displacement function Y1. And this will be the displacement function valid from 0 to D and in no other region. However, on the right side, we have a different region of the beam. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this is governed by displacement function Y2. And Y2 is going to be valid from D all the way until L. And again, that's the only region it's going to be valid from, no other region. So if we take a step back, we can say, all right, well, I actually have two scenarios. On the left side, I have a beam. It has two boundary conditions on the left, two boundary conditions on the right. And of course, we have a nice differential equation. The same thing can be said for the beam on the right. So it just comes down to solving these two differential equations. And as a result, we're going to get two displacement functions. So if we look at how we solve these beams, we know that the critical thing is going to be boundary conditions. Inputting those nice, simple partial differential equations in Mathematica, 
That's a piece of cake. You guys know exactly how to do that. But you guys know in order to obtain a solution, we actually need boundary conditions. So that's what we're going to look for right here. Now, just like in the previous slide, I've defined my two beams, my two scenarios. And of course, we have the shear and moments that are released once we open up this beam. So what we're going to do is we're going to say the beam on the left is governed by the displacement function y1 and the beam on the right is governed by the displacement function y2. So if we have two different displacement functions, we have two differential equations and we know that each one of those differential equations requires four boundary conditions. So if each one requires four boundary conditions, if I want to solve for both of these deflection functions or both of these differential equations, I'm actually going to need a total of eight boundary conditions, four for each one of those equations above. How do we do that? Well, we look at the boundary regions of each one of these beams. So we, in total, we have three regions that we want to inspect. The first one's going to be x1 is equal to 0, and the second one is going to be x1 is equal to L. So those are kind of trivial. You guys can get those right off the bat. Now, the region that's going to create some confusion probably for most students is going to be that one in the middle where x1 is equal to D, because that's going to be a little bit special, and we're going to talk about that in a few seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a nice table here. And for each one of these locations, I'm going to list my boundary conditions. So if I'm looking at x1 is equal to 0, it's very important to note that only the deflection function y1 is valid in this region. <coughs> Therefore, all of my boundary conditions are going to relate to y1. Now, if we look at x1 is equal to 0, we see that we have a fixed end. Therefore, the displacement as well as the rotation at that point are going to be equal to 0. So my boundary conditions are going to be y1 at 0 is equal to 0, and y1 prime at 0 is equal to 0. Now if we move on to the second location, x1 is equal to L, we can see that that region is governed by solely the displacement function y2. So all my boundary conditions here are going to be related to y2. Now if we look at x1 is equal to L, again it's a fixed end beam, therefore we are going to have the same relationships we did on the other side, where both the displacement and the rotation are equal to 0. Therefore two more boundary conditions would be y2 at L is equal to 0, and y2 prime at L is equal to 0. So right now we have four boundary conditions, we need eight, so we're halfway there. And the boundary conditions that we covered, these are kind of the most trivial, these are the ones that you guys are going to get no problem. The things, the boundary conditions that start getting a little confusing are when x1 is actually equal to d. Because if we look at that point x1 is equal to d, it's governed by both y1 and y2. Now this is a good and a bad thing. It's a bad thing because it seems like it's actually really confusing, but it's a good thing because we know the relationship between y1 and y2 at that specific point. If we were to look at our deflection function, we know that our deflection function is going to be continuous. Therefore, y1 at d is actually going to be equal to y2 at d. What does this mean? This means that when I substitute x1 is equal to d into y1 and x1 of d, x1 is equal to d into y2, they should give me the exact same displacements. Therefore, a boundary condition would be y1 at d is equal to y2 at d. And this is the exact same thing for rotation. We know that the rotation is the slope of that point, and the slope of that point must be equal on both sides. Therefore, y1 prime at d must be equal to y2 prime at d. Now, if we're looking at this, we're saying, great, we are up to six boundary conditions. We only need two more. But the boundary conditions that we typically use are all gone. We covered all of the displacement ones, and we covered all of the rotation ones. So all we're actually going to have to do is get into the moment and the shear boundary conditions. So if we're looking at the moment diagram of this beam, it is also continuous. Therefore, that the moment at D of region Y1 must be equal to the moment produced by Y2 in region 2. Therefore, I can say that EI multiplied by Y1 double prime at D is equal to EI Y2 double prime at D. What does this mean? This basically means that both equations produce the same moment at point D. So, so far, everything's actually pretty nice. We said that the displacement, the rotation, and the moment of both of those equations is going to be the exact same at point D. However, once we get to shear, it's going to be a little bit different. Because if we remember, our discontinuity was created by that shear diagram. If we looked at region Y1, we had a positive shear. If we looked at region Y2, we actually had a negative shear. Therefore, when I'm writing my shear, 
boundary condition for these. It's not EI Y1 triple prime at D is equal to EI Y2 triple prime at D. We actually have to account for that discontinuity by a factor of P. So what my actual boundary condition would be is EI multiplied by Y1 triple prime at D minus R load P is equal to EI Y2 triple prime at D nice and straightforward, or at least hopefully it is. So this is where we account for that axial load P. And this makes sense because if I were to say that the shear is equal to on both sides, not once in our differential equation or our boundary conditions, are we actually accounting for that axial load P? Therefore, we know that something's particularly wrong. So once we have this, we have our eight boundary conditions, we can solve those two differential equations for our two displacement functions, which is what it asks for in part A and part B. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. In my opinion, this is the hardest part of the assignment. Once you guys get this, you guys will be good to go. Alrighty guys, welcome to Mathematica. As we've seen, I haven't really done anything yet. All I've done is clear all the parameters that we are going to store as well as define all of the parameters I was given in the question. So of course, P is equal to 27 kilonewtons. Uh, the distance D was 1.5 meters, but I threw that bad boy into a fraction. The length L was 10 meters. Uh, the elastic modulus was 20 GPA. But to keep my units consistent, this must be in KPA. So therefore, I added the additional six zeros to that bad boy. And then finally, the moments of inertia which I define as IG, it was 0 0.003 meters to the fourth. So that's just simply three divided by a thousand. So again, keeping everything in fractions as well as keeping my units consistent. Now, another thing that we're going to see is we are going to use the term EI a lot. So I just thought it'd be easier to define EI as EM multiplied by IG right off the bat, instead of having to go EM times IG <laughs> many times throughout the exact solution. All right, so again, all I've done was define the parameters. I haven't done anything else. So the first step that we were asked to do is find the exact solution. And we said that our exact solution is actually governed by two differential equations, one for each region of the beam. So if I'm going to say, all right, my first equation is going to be the differential equation for the left side of the beam. So from zero all the way equal to D. So we know that this is EI multiplied by the fourth derivative of displacement function y1. So y1, fourth derivative, and this of course is going to be a function of x1. Now, normally when we're solving the differential equation for Euler Bernoulli beams, we go minus q at the end because we're putting that q to the other side. But since q is equal to zero, it is actually not needed in this case. And again, since we are talking about the left region of the beam, I'm defining that as displacement function y1. Now we know that we have a second differential equation, one for the other side of the beam, which we called y2. And again, it's going to be the same formula without anything changing except for it being y2 instead of y1. Now notice that both of these, of course, are a function of x1, not a function of x2 or anything like that. All right. So with this being defined, we can actually solve our differential equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to say sol, which I put as solution, is equal to d solve. And again, using the d-cell function, we can solve for differential equations. Now, this takes three inputs. The first input here in the squiggle brackets are going to be all of my equations, as well as my boundary conditions. The second input in our squiggle brackets are going to be what differential equations do we want to solve for. So we know that we want to find y1 as a function of x1, but we also want to find y2 as a function of x1. So in this particular case, we're actually solving for two differential equations, not just one differential equation. And finally, the last argument is what uh, variable are we doing this with? Well, of course, we are doing this with x1. So the only thing that we actually have to do to obtain our solution right now is input our equations as well as our boundary conditions. So our first equation, equation one, well, we know that this is actually going to be equal to zero and the same thing for equation two we know that that's also going to be equal to zero. So at this point right here, these are my two differential equations. These are not boundary conditions of these differential equations. So now after that, I can actually start inputting the boundary conditions of each differential equation. So we're gonna start off with the simple ones. We know that for equation one, which is the left region of the beam, we know that at x1 is equal to zero, the rotation as well as the displacement is equal to zero. So what I can say is I can say y1 at zero, well, that's going to be equal to zero. So again, this would be the displacement at x1 is equal to zero. That's equal to zero. 
Secondly, we know that the rotation at x1 is equal to 0, so I'm going to say y1 prime at 0, this is equal to 0. So again, this is just the displacement and the rotation at x1 is equal to 0. And we know since it's fixed, it's going to be equal to 0. And again, I also want to emphasize that since this is the left region of the beam, this is differential equation, or sorry, displacement function y1, not y2. Now, if we look at the other side of the beam when x1 is equal to L, this region is governed by y2. And again, we know that the displacement and the rotation is equal to 0. So what I can do is I can say y2 at L, this is going to be equal to 0. And of course, y2 prime at L, this will also be equal to 0. All right. So if I were to run this right now, what we can see is it takes forever because we still actually have a bunch of coefficients. We have c3, c4, uh, c6, and c7. So since we have four unknowns, we know that we actually need four more boundary conditions. And this makes sense because we said we needed eight and we've only defined four. Therefore, we need to start adding more in. Now, this is where things get a little bit interesting because now we're going to look at the region of x1 is equal to d. So I said that the displacement of y1 at x1 is equal to d is the displacement of y2 when x1 is equal to d. So what I can do is I can say y1 at d is going to be equal to y2 also at d. This means that the displacement of both of these equations should be the exact same at point d. And similar, similarly, we said that the rotation there is also the same. So I can say y1 prime at d must be equal to y2 prime at d. All right. So I basically said that the displacement at that point must be the same, as well as the rotation at that point must be the same. So if I run this now, as we can see, we only have two unknown coefficients, c3 and c4. So we actually need two more boundary conditions, but we said that this is expected, of course. Now, the next one we said is the moment at both of these equations, sorry, the moment produced by each one of these equations must be the same also at point D. So what we're going to do is we're going to say EI times Y1 double prime at D is equal to EI times Y2 double prime at D. Basically that the moment produced by Y1 at D must be the same as the moment produced by Y2 at D. Run this bad boy. We can only see that we have one more unknown coefficient. And we said that this, of course, will be related to shear. So I'm going to go comma here. We know that shear is EI times the third derivative. So we're going to say EI times Y triple prime at D is actually equal to EI times Y2 triple prime at D. Now, the key here is we said that the shears at these points is actually not the same. Remember, this is where the discontinuity happens. Therefore, we actually have to account for the change in the shear, which was a factor or the, where the change in shear was the magnitude of our load P. So we know that the shear at the, on the left-hand side is actually not equal to the shear at the right-hand side. What happens is it decreases by a magnitude of P. So basically, we're saying that the shear of Y1 minus P is equal to the shear at y2. Now when I solve this, I can see that I have both y1 and y2 as a function of x1 with, un with no unknown coefficients. Therefore, I am good to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to define y1 and y2 as their own separate variables. So y1 and y2 are equal to y1 of x1 comma y2 of, oops, wrong bracket, <laughs> y2 of x1 specifically when the solution at one. All right, so now we have y1 and y2 as their own thing. So if I were to just say y1 right now, as we can see, it gives us the function of y1. Now, why is this important? Because we want to plot these. So I'm going to suppress that, and I'm just going to get rid of the equations below. So the question becomes, how do we plot a piecewise function? Well, we're going to use the same plot function that we used before, and it's going to take the same inputs two specifically. The first one is in these squiggle brackets, what equation do you want to plot or equations because you can plot more than one. And then in the second squiggle brackets, you guys are going to say the range of the beam. So we know that the range, of course, is a function of x1 and it goes from zero all the way until L. So this will be the entirety of the beam. However, what do we want to plot? Well, we want to plot this piecewise function, which is y1 and y2. So how do we do that? Well, we can actually specify piecewise in Mathematica, which is great. And this is a function, so it's going to be these nice square brackets. And inside, we are going to define our two functions as well as the range in which they are valid. 
So the first one right here, we want to plot y1, and we know that this is valid when x1 is actually less than d. Or you can go less than or equal to, it's actually not going to make a big difference, but we know that y1 is only valid from 0 to d, therefore I'm going to say we're only considering y1 when x1 is less than d. Now in the second set of squiggle brackets, we know we want to plot y2, and in this case this is when x1 is greater or equal to d, so the second half of that beam. Alright, so when I plot this here, we can see that we have our nice displacement function over here. The maximum load is a little bit to the left of the center of the beam, so this is when x1 is equal to 5. The center of the beam is about right here. The maximum displacement is a little bit to the left, and this, is, of course, is expected.